Hello, fellow aging. Mates. It's Debbie Potts, and I am talking today to Dr. Minkoff. And you may have heard of him. He is very well known in the Ironman world. He's actually uh, finished Ironman Hawaii eight times, 43 full Ironman triathlons. So he's undone his share of races. He's a leading physician, a best selling author athlete, obviously, and devoted family man on a mission to help people optimize their health and vitality so they can live a prosperous life right in hand with what I'm focused on, how to recreate ourselves now so we can live our best lives or second half of our life and create the optimal future self. Who do you want to be when you're 70, 80, 90, hundred years old? Let's start doing what we can do now so we are thriving as we get older, stay youthful as we age, and improve daily performance in life, and hopefully continue doing the sports, the activities, the outdoor adventures that we love to do. So how do we do that? We need to learn how to fuel and train and perform slightly different as we age, we're going to talk about protein, of course, amino acids, and what other things that we can look at to optimize our genetic potential, key to solving weight loss, fatigue, how to improve recovery and repair, and all areas of health and fitness for the aging athlete. So let's dive in to all things health optimization for the aging athlete who wants to be fit and healthy from the inside out. Hang on. Okay. I'm excited to talk about my favorite topic, prioritizing health for the aging athlete, how to improve ourselves today so we can thrive as we get older, not struggle. <laughs> so Dr. David Minkoff, thanks for joining my podcast to be fit and healthy from the inside out as we age. Thank you, Debbie. Excited and to be here. Yeah. You, you're in Florida and I'm in San Diego. We're just chatting about you used to live here and the, the triathlon Mecca it used to be in the eighties with Mark Allen and all these other triathletes started here and moved on and you're, you moved on and you're still racing. Yes. I'm still racing. It was Mark Allen and, um, uh, Scott Tinley. He still and lives here. <laughs> Scott Molina, um, the big three out of four. Dave Scott never came to San Diego, but um, it, those were glory days. I did my first Ironman in 1982, uh, and there was a Nike sponsored team. I was on the team. Um, it was uh, it was heaven. Like it was heaven. <sighs> You didn't stay here as some people. I know Bob Babbitt's in Solana Beach here too. And so there's a lot of people from the area, but you wanted warmer waters to swim in, you said. Yeah, the career wise, I was, we were in San Diego for 16 years. I went to, did my residency and inter, or internship residency and fellowship at UCSD. And then I stayed on and did, uh, I was an infectious disease doctor and I was, uh, I was part-time faculty there. And then in 1990, we moved here to Florida. Yeah. So I know UCSD is pretty on top of it for integrative medicine and really looking at more, a different perspective, it seems, in other universities for in the medical system and their hospitals, more progressive. Very you know? little, really. yeah, <laughs> very little. My, I have a doctor that just joined me who finished a residency in internal medicine at UCSD, and she almost got killed there sort of spiritually oh. and psychologically because the you know, the sort of culture there of, of, uh, this, we are the authorities and you do what we say and, you know, wear your mask and shut up and get your vaccine was, uh, was just about killed her. So yeah. she, uh, I, I don't think the culture there is moved very far, uh -oh. at least at her level. I, that may not be true because I have experience with one person, but that mm -hmm. was her. Hmm. So what's your focus? What's your what's your, what are you working on? What's your mission, your why that your, you know, medical system, but also as an athlete and health optimization, talk a little bit about your, what drives you. So 
career-wise, I want to transform the healthcare system so that it actually is a healthcare system and not a disease system. Mm -hmm. Whole orientation, the whole sort of structure control is pharmaceutical government. Um, we're gonna we're gonna sell you things that don't really make your health better. They may help you. I'm not I'm not anti-pharmaceutical. But um, the progress that's been made and that should be what people are being taught is how to eat, how to live, what's important, sleep and relationships and these sorts of things. And the healthcare system is is very little about that. There are some pockets now that that are happening. But even at the beginning of the COVID epidemic, you know, 86 percent, I think, of all the people who died of COVID had a vitamin D level that was below 30. We try to keep our patients in a level of 70 to 90. Mm -hmm. People who have, you know, so you're in a nursing home, you're 78 years old, you got a vitamin D level, it's 10, you're eating crappy food, you never get outside. You know, that, that those are the people who mostly died. And it was, and, and so the focus at the time was really on all the wrong things. It should have been, you know, who died? It's people with four or five other comorbidities. They were diabetics. They were obese. They never exercised. They ate lousy food. They had low vitamin D levels. They were nutritionally malnourished. And if you would have sort of put into the environment at that early time, hey, here's what it takes to be healthy and to not die of a significant infectious disease. This is, was not a nothing thing. But 99% of people who got it survived. And the ones that didn't survive are the ones that were, they were, they were just very vulnerable. And it was based on their lifestyle and their habits. And I think if that focus went in, even, even now, I mean, that's what we're trying to do is how can you help people learn to understand their bodies? What does it take to be healthy? How can you at, I'm 75, how can you at 75, you know, work a 10 hour day, train for triathlons, um, have a good family life and, um, and enjoy yourself. Cause you know, when I was, when I was started doing triathlons in my thirties, you know, there would be sometimes eight, 900 people in an age group to race. And now <laughs> I race a lot and there might be four or five of us on a big race or two of us in a small race. And it's like, where are you guys? You know, you're where are you guys? Why aren't you out here? It's no fun, um, you know, to enter a race and know you're going to win your age group and there's only one other guy there. Yeah. <laughs> um, so I, I think that the whole notion of what is aging, when are you old? Like my goal for the last... 10 years has been, I want to win my age group in Hawaii when I'm 85 years old. So, you know, that's a 10 years ahead, but I'm, I'm think about that every day and I'm planning on it. So I think when you get people oriented the right way, they do things and they live such that they can get there. Yeah. And, um, you know, I may never make it, but by golly, I'm trying and, you know, it's a, it's an attitude about, about, uh, you know, what are you here for and what are you supposed to do? And so part of my mission is really to teach people this and get them to understand it. And, and there isn't any quick fix, you know, it's not, mm -hmm. you know, health is not, there's no free lunch in health. Mm -hmm. You can't eat at McDonald's three days a week or have coffee and a bagel for breakfast and think that you're going to be healthy. It, there's just no way the mm -hmm. stresses in the environment now are very high worse than they've ever been you know hundreds of thousands of toxic chemicals toxic food we do a we do a toxin panel on every patient that we see and everybody flunks everybody's full of bpa mm -hmm. everybody's full of glyphosate i've never had a patient i've done thousands of these that didn't have urine full of glyphosate which is roundup Okay. Yeah. If we're going to yeah. turn the society, what has to happen is you, the only vote that counts is what you buy. The yeah. only 
thing that matters is where do you spend your money? Your choices, what choices Those you make. Choices. And if you go to places that have organic food and places that have toxic free food and support farms that grow animals in, in a sustainable way, then that is where the big boys who run everything are going to go. Mm -hmm. And then it will be available on a bigger scale. If you buy artificial meat and, you know, and all this other stuff, that is what's going to come. And that just isn't what human bodies were designed to eat. And they don't, they don't work. So, so, so that's, is that kind of what you're working on with your clients and your clinic? how we can optimize our health. And I keep saying, you know, what we can do now to recreate ourselves. So we are best version of our future self. And that is taking ownership of the, our health, what we're doing now, making the choices. We choose to do these different things and how to make the right choices with nutrition, exercise, lifestyle habits to be a health optimizer. Is that kind of working on the foundations first? Yeah. And, and, you know, your cells turn over, you know, within a year, most of your cells have turned over. So you, you can grow yourself a new body. Your bones are slower, but most of the tissues in the body have a turnover, right? And they grow new cells and the new cells get filled up with whatever you're putting in there now. And so if you, if a person got sort of not serious, but got dedicated to, to generating a new body, that within a year, most of what your body tissues are now aren't going to be those. Those are going to be new tissues and they're going to incorporate the new stuff that you do. And that's really important. Most of my practice is people with serious unsolved medical problems. You know, it's people, our average patient has seen 13 doctors yep. without a solution. So they've got cancer and autoimmune disease and Alzheimer's and all these other stuff. And they have been somewhat, you know, most of this isn't a genetic problem. OK, it's not their genes that are bad. It's been a lifestyle problem for almost everybody. And mm -hmm. they probably didn't do it on purpose, but they did it because they just didn't know what to do or they weren't coached right. Or they had a physician tell them, well, you got high blood pressure. You take this drug or these two or three drugs because they don't high blood pressure don't, don't, don't work for many people. And never mind that now you have ED because the drugs cause that. But I've got another pill for that. And your cholesterol is too high, and I got a pill for that. And your joints hurt, and I got a pill for that. And you got borderline diabetes, and I got a pill for that. And if you think that you can ever get longevity and health out of that, it's very hard. And so, you know, these patients come in, and they're loaded. When, when I was in the, when one of the things I did in, uh, when I first got to Florida was I was an emergency room doctor. And um, a lot of people that come to the emergency room live in nursing homes. And they have a problem and they put them on the, they call the ambulance and they bring them in. And our average patient was on 12 prescriptions. Okay. And so you get an older person who's kind of out of it. And it seems like they got a bellyache, but they can't tell you. And they come to the emergency room. And so we would, we, we had a computer in the emergency room where you could plug in all their, their medications and it would give you interactions between the medications or side effects from those medications. But the computer, if you put in more than three drugs, would go tilt. Because you look at any drug you want, look at the physician's desk reference or one of the drug manuals, the lists are pages of potential side effects. And when you put 12 of them together, there's no way anybody could figure out what's going on. And one of the routine things that we would do is put an IV in them, give them some hydration, put them upstairs, hold all their drugs. Their regular physician would see them in the morning and then he would make a decision on what they really had to continue, what they didn't. And a lot of times if they, the, the drugs came off, the person would wake up, they would feel better. You know, it was interactions. It was, it was, it was the pharmacology that was actually hurting the person. And so, you know, if you look at um, leading causes of death in the United States, if you go, the, the last good statistics are like 2019. Just Google leading causes of death. Number one is heart attacks. Number two is cancer. 
Number three right now is, is mental decline on some version or another, assisted by diabetes and other things. But then if you go to Google and you put in number of deaths in the United States from, and the term is called iatrogenic. So it's I-A-T-R-O-G-E-N-I-C. Iatrogenic means doctor caused. Number of doctor caused related deaths in the United States. It's more than all the people who died of heart attacks because drug reactions, hospital wrong surgeries, falls in hospitals related to doctor prescribed things, it can be very dangerous. Now I'm not anti-medicine at all, at all, because there are aspects of medicine which are wonderful. If you're having a heart attack, if you're, you need a C-section, if you break your leg, you know, like modern medicine is spectacular. But if you have a lifestyle related illness, you know, fatigue, diabetes, pain, you know, no energy, depression, anxiety, modern medicine is terrible at these things. If, you're, if your goal is actually health. And so you got to pay attention to this, these other lifestyle considerations and diet and supplementation. And um, most people can really be helped by that if they know what to do. Yes, I know firsthand, and my, I won't go <laughs> talk about this and I'll start crying, but my dad just died last year and I just was talking to my mom this morning about it and it it's not the focus of the podcast <laughs> today, but it is, I th- I always blame the doctors because he had a heart disease, he had a heart attack 10 years before, heart disease doctor, then he got a type of cancer, so he's on some chemo drug that kept damaging him more and trying to figure out what chemo drug to give him that affected his kidneys, and then he had the kidney doctor who just wanted to do kidney dialysis. And all three of them kept giving them more meds and didn't look at how the body works and treat the patient. So, yeah, but I I want to get into if the athlete, I think so many athletes, as I try to share on this show, are endurance athletes, training for Ironmans, 50 Ks, you know, long distance cycling events, whatever endurance events, but how to improve the aging process because long distance cardio, chronic cardio, isn't so ideal (laughs) for our body and the stress and our hormones and damage oxidative stress. What can they do? We do to improve the aging process. So we are fit and healthy from the inside out. So it's all, it's all the stuff we said, but I think that, that when you're, when you're doing extreme things that you have to figure out for yourself, what's the least effective dose (laughs) <laughs> minimal yeah. effective dose. I say that all the time. Yeah. And then I think that you have to hook up with someone knowledgeable who can evaluate you, test you and see, are you handling what you're doing? You know, levels of vitamins, minerals, amino acids, get a stool test, see what kind of bugs are growing in your gut. You know, these are things, What we? these are things that are that you might not feel right away, but when you get down the road and the stressors accumulate, then you will you will get hit. Mm-hmm. And then if something like COVID comes or you get um, you know a toxic exposure, then your body, while you might be doing okay or you think you're doing okay, is a little bit fragile. And it can it can it can take you down. So I think preventive health means knowing where you are, so that the things that are we're we're all accumulating tons of toxins in our body, and everyone has their limit. And when you hit your limit, and then you get overextended by doing too much, or being exposed to too much, then then you'll go down. And then that is either injury or it's poor response to training, or it's, you know, fatigue or poor sleep or hangnails, or you get the flu and six weeks later, you still can't go go for a good run because your body is just tanked. You know, your mm-hmm. mitochondria are all stressed out and they don't, they don't make energy anymore. Mm-hmm. And so I think the, that being on top of that with, and there's all kinds of people who are doing this, you know, there's health coaches and there's chiropractors and nature baths and MPs and, you know, and Debbie to 
do the you know the needed test so that you can check out and you can know what you're doing. I got into the uh, uh, you know, I got into the amino acid business because I injured myself. I was doing, I was training for Ironman triathlons. I thought I could be a vegetarian and, and it would work out. Well, I got protein malnourished. I tore my hamstring at the UCSD track. Hmm. Okay. I used yeah. to go there once a week and do repeat quarters or halves. And I tore my hamstring and I did, could not get it to heal. I did everything. I heated it, colded it, chiropractored it, massaged it, acupunctured it, injected it, would not stably heal. And every time I tried to push a little bit, I could feel it. It was painful. And it turned out I was, uh, it was essential amino acid deficient. Mm. And um, I had no idea. I was sure that I was on a good diet. And when I measured my serum amino acids, they were very low. And I started playing with amino acid blends and came up with what we now call perfect amino. And in six weeks, my hamstring healed. And I couldn't believe it. Like that was the joyous thing that ever happened to me in my life. Okay. Because <laughs> doing triathlons was yes. very important to me. I think everyone understands that. <laughs> so, and then, so that was like June or July. And I had done Ironman Canada probably a dozen times. And it's a hard race, you know, it's a, it's a, it's a, that was my one. favorite. I did it for years. Yeah. So it's, so I had my best race ever. I did the swim in 62 minutes. I, I, I had trouble there a couple of times because it was cold and I had very low body fat um, anyway. And then I had a great bike ride and I did, I think I did 11 20 or something. That was my best Ironman. And it was, um, and, and I was fine. And um, I gained all this lean body mass from doing nothing more than what I was doing before. I was protein malnourished and I couldn't, you know, my body couldn't do it. So I think people need help to sort themselves out mm -hmm. and, and, and then they can, they can do better and they'll see the response in their own body. They'll see the improvements. Yeah. I and think then, it's, I think, Oh, and then the, just the last part of that, then I think, you know, um, Phil Maffetone, wrote this book about must be 30 years ago, yeah. but in, <laughs> in fitness and health, uh, something about an athlete. And he, he, I learned this from him because he was a, con he's a contemporary of mine. We're about the same age mm -hmm. and he was hanging around San Diego. And I spent a lot of time with him learning his ideas and his ideas are still the most valid things around. Yeah. And, if you're healthy, you can be a long lived athlete for a long time. But if you're not healthy, you may have a peak few years, but you'll miss your best years. You know, you're 25 years old and you're very fast now, but your body is really going downhill. You're not going to win an Ironman at age 37 or win a marathon at age 37 or even do your best, which is what should be happening. Mm -hmm. and so, health this health criteria is really good are you recovering are you in pain all the time you know and then then assessments of that so that you can then plug in the right supplements nutrients um other modalities um to to help yourself recover i have a thousand questions yeah i totally agree i think that's i used to raise in my listeners no, my story. I got adrenal exhaustion, air quotes, 2013, right after we had our superhuman coach conference. And we're talking about adrenal issues and HPA access. And it's kind of the beginning of all that. And I damaged my body in a way that I've never been able to get to that level again. And so it's my purpose, I find, to help other athletes avoid doing what I did to myself. So in the past 10 years, I became a nutritional therapy practitioner and an FDM practitioner where I'm more a health investigator. Now I'm doing wild health fellowship next year to get into the genetic side of it. But it's, it's getting people to understand not to wait until you're broken to take action now, because I struggle getting clients to listen to their body, listen to those red flags, invest in their health. They don't want to spend 300, $500 on coaching or a functional lab test until they're broken. And I'm trying to get it across people. Don't wait until you can't do what you love to do. 
take preventative action now because you don't have to take years to repair yourself and the damage that you do from chronic stress of doing everything too much. And that minimal effective dose, as we spoke about is so important. So it's, it's looking at us being in a catabolic state was my other question, going back to protein that do you think that you're, you and other athletes, we're pushing ourselves. We're doing a lot of endurance exercise and people are not doing as much resistance training as they should, but with the information out now, muscle protein synthesis and muscle health is the organ of longevity. And Dr. Gabrielle Lyon and Donald Lehman talking about the importance of prioritizing protein and resistance training. I'm always wondering if we, or myself, I wasn't eating enough protein one, two, that I wasn't digesting it properly. Cause it's hard to digest and break down, especially if you have low stomach acid or H pylori, you don't have the right enzymes to break it down. And then we're in a catabolic state from doing the chronic cardio, so to speak, and being stressed out all the time. So it's just, you know, the importance of protein supplementation, I think is so important for the athlete that's driven, ambitious endurance athlete, but also just people that are trying to survive life. Yeah. And the whole metabolic aspect of this, because a lot of people are metabolically unhealthy. You yes. know, their fasting insulins are high, their glucoses may be high, their triglycerides may be high. Like these are really important things because they 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 give you, they tell you what state, what's the state of your biochemistry. You know, the, the body is basically a biochemical, very sophisticated uh, put together. And if the biochemistry is not working right, then you're either not up to your potential or you're on a slide to go down. Yeah. Uh, and, and that really makes a difference. I, I, you know, when aura ring first came out, I bought one because I like to experiment. And, uh, so I was getting sleep scores in like the mid fifties. Now I had acclimated myself to not sleep much because there's a lot of things I like to do. And I figured when I died, I'd sleep, but until I died, I wasn't going to sleep any more than I absolutely had to. Now, some of it was because of career, because when I was in the, when I was in the hospital, I was an infectious disease doctor and pediatrician. We were on call every third night and I, you know, I could sleep for four, four and a half hours and, and get by, you know, and um, then if I was going to get up at, at four thirty or five o'clock and train for three hours and then go to the office at eight o'clock and then work till six or seven and then come home and have, you know, I've got kids and a wife and all that stuff. Well, there just wasn't room. So you know, if I got to bed by 1130 and I got up at 4, 430 and I'd be at the swim practice at five o'clock, I was just like, fine. So I continued that for a long time. And yeah. I get this ring and my scores are like, like, man, you're terrible. You're terrible. And I was, I was just like oblivious to it. And so I sort of just made a decision. Okay. I'm going to, I'm going to get in bed every night by 11, by sorry, 10 o'clock lights off. And I'm my, my, I wake up usually about quarter to five. So close to seven hours and my sleep scores, my, my score this morning was 85. It's really nice. good. My readiness score was 87. So like I, you, you get these tools and they help mm -hmm. you. I got mine. You, can be, <laughs> you can be numb and dumb and not really know what's going on. And it only works for so long. And so if you start to tune into this stuff, you can be wiser and you can be healthier. And I actually feel way better than I used to. I just thought that's how you felt when you were doing all that stuff. Yeah. You don't but, know how good you could feel. You just accept that's your new normal and that's how you, yeah. your body operates. Yeah. yeah. And so, so, and then you have bandwidth to do, to do this, you know, to do the hard track day or to do the long run day or, you know, to, to beat yourself up in the pool, you know, with where, where the bodies actually can accommodate the stress mm -hmm. and win from the stress and not just get further broken down from the stress. Yeah. No, I, I do think that's what my mission on this podcast is to help athletes that are still training and racing a lot, or even just me who trains just because I like to, I don't have any race anymore to go for, but I just do what I love to do that we need to remember how to 
make sure we're recovering and repairing and test and not guess if we are metabolically healthy, because I find that we all go to the doctor and maybe get your, maybe you go to the doctor and get an annual checkup. And I try to get the blood work, give them my list and insurance doesn't cover anything. And the lab work all comes back and you're normal and <laughs> they're awful. And I get so frustrated because I know our functional ranges and what we do as FDM practitioners and look at optimal. And when I have to go through a client's labs that they think they're all normal, but they can't figure out what's wrong. I'm like, well, let's look at it in our lens, a different perspective in functional medicine and correlate all this information together. It's like, whoa, we've got red flags all over here. But if you don't see someone in the functional space, everyone's fine. You're normal. You're doing great. Keep it up. See you next year. And they don't know what even their insulin is or their vitamin D. Right. Right. And the, the, and most of the people that are practicing medicine have no understanding of this. They don't know anything about it and, and they, they are not helpful. Mm -hmm. And so you, you just have to see somebody like yourself or somebody like me where people are, you're, you're, you know, you're putting a, you're really looking, you're putting the magnifying glass on there and really looking at the things that are markers that show like you're, you're actually doing okay, mm -hmm. or you're not. I mean, I, I have a referral practice of people who are very accomplished at, at, at what they're doing. Some of them are NASCAR drivers and some of them are professional golfers and, and, you know, some of them are triathletes or they're or CrossFit guys, you know, where they're, they, they want to compete and they love it and they find sort of a like-minded person in me. And so when we start looking into things, I just tell them, you just have to budget for health and that's testing yeah. and supplements and practitioner fees. And I think you just set aside a certain portion of your, of your budget mm -hmm. where you can afford to get this stuff. Cause you're going to spend three, $4,000 on testing. If it's really good testing. Yeah. It costs a lot. And, uh, you know, and, but, but then you get information that, that, that will help you for years ahead mm -hmm. and, you know, forego a weekend, long weekend vacation or, you know, whatever, if that's, a, if, if, it's, if it's not in your budget, so that you can, um, you know, you only got one body go around this time. <laughs> and if you have things that you want to get done, you want to keep it going. There's, there's a perspective on this, which has helped me. I'll just tell it to you. In the days of Moses, so this is like a thousand BC. Okay, so like 3000 years ago. When Moses died, he was 120 years old. And so he was the, the patriarch of the whole people, and he was setting the example of what should happen. And so the culture adopted this idea that you should live to 120. Like, that's what's expected of you. Okay? So if someone was 75, and they said, well, how old are you? And they said, well, I'm 75 slash 120. You know, it's like, I'm only 75 into or 65 into 120. So before I started really thinking about this, I'm thinking, oh God, I'm 75. I've outlived both my parents. Okay. That sounds terrible. And I could feel my body do like a sag, like, oh, okay. And then I thought, oh no, Moses, I'm 75 slash 120. Oh, I'm good. I'm good. And the whole body goes like, oh, we're good. Let's go for it. There's medical studies where they ask people at 40, how long do you think you're going to live? And they give a number. And most people come within two years of their number. So set a high number. And then if you knew you were going to live that long, what would you do now so that you could, so that you could make it, you know, you wouldn't go, you wouldn't go to Taco Bell. I guarantee it. No. Yeah. No, I just watch all my parents' friends in their 80s and watching people I've known for 30 years and seeing when they're 80 something, what's happening. And it just makes me frustrated and just of our whole system. So with that, how does protein play, play a role in this? You created the perfect amino acid years ago and wrote a book about it. What's the problem with protein? And you talked about not getting enough of it, being vegetarian. But let's talk about protein and why are we so malnourished and why is it such a big topic suddenly that I guess we went from paleo to carnivore to keto to carnivore. Now it's all protein, muscle protein synthesis. So it's good for your business. <laughs> right. So 
protein is the basic structure of the whole tissues of all the body. So it's your organs, it's your bones, it's your immune system, it's all your enzymes, and you need it, okay? The normal way that someone gets protein is they eat something that's protein. And, um, you know, for the, for, the, for the two and a half billion year history of humans on earth, most of the proteins were related to, to animal related proteins. You know, there was no grains until 10,000 years ago when people ate fish and deer and rabbits and whatever they could find. A good portion of that 2 million years was ice age. And so there weren't a lot of fruits and vegetables around. People just ate, they, they ate animals. And meat is the only nutritional product that has everything that you need. Now, I'm not saying you shouldn't eat other things, but our bodies now have a super challenge because in order to, to take the protein from the food that we eat, it has to be processed, so to speak, so that it can be broken down so that our bodies can actually accept it. Now, a protein is made up of smaller units, which are called amino acids. Amino in Greek means nitrogen. So these are carbon, hydrogen, oxygen molecules that have nitrogen added to them. So if you took a muscle fiber from a chicken leg or a lamb chop, and you were able to magnify it millions of times at one fiber of protein, what you would find is that single muscle fiber had about 5,600 separate amino acids that made up that one fiber. Whoa. Now there's about 22 amino acids. And so the body, these are like, if you're gonna, if you're gonna create a necklace and there's a formula for you know, a red bead and a blue bead and a white bead, and then that formula repeats, the way proteins are manufactured in the body is similar. There's a template of here's what this muscle protein looks like, or here's what this digestive enzyme looks like, or here's what this, you know, insulin or growth hormone looks like, because those are all proteins. And so the body has to be able to break down that muscle fiber with 5,600 amino acids in it into single amino acids because the intestine won't absorb that gigantic, so to speak, structure. It won't go in. Now, in order for that to happen, it goes into the stomach. There's a digestive enzyme in the stomach called pepsin. It only works when there's acid. Probably at least 50 or 60% of the people above 30 years old don't manufacture enough stomach acid. They're iron deficient, they're iodine deficient, they're zinc deficient, they're, they're, they, they don't manufacture enough stomach acid, which means that this pepsin doesn't get activated, which means the first step in breaking down this 5,600 amino acid chain isn't happening very well. Now, that gets passed on to the small intestine and the pancreas is supposed to make some more enzymes to break that down further. And many, many people are pancreatic enzyme insufficient because pancreatic enzymes are proteins. Now, if you're not getting enough protein, your weak link in your body might be that you don't make enough pancreatic enzymes. So now you're trying to digest that thing down further and it doesn't happen very well. Not that it doesn't happen at all, it just doesn't happen as well as it should. Now, when you don't have stomach acid and you eat some sushi or you eat some vegetables, and virtually you eat anything because none of the food, you know, nobody's eating bore, boiled, sterile food. That food has bacteria and yeast and God knows what on it. And the way the body protects itself when that food comes in is it boils it in stomach acid. But the guy doesn't have stomach acid. Or there's 25 million people in the United States that take drugs that block stomach acid. Okay, you want to kill yourself? Take those drugs. I'm yeah. not telling you to stop. But in 99% of people, you can be fixed so that you don't need that drug. So then if, if you don't have stomach acid, your absorption of minerals and your ability to digest proteins goes way down. And now you get overgrowth in your, in your small intestine of yeast and bacteria. And this is called SIBO. And SIBO is very, very common. And when you get SIBO, you inflame 
the inner lining of your intestine where the absorption is supposed to happen of these single amino acids, and then they don't get absorbed either. And so, and then you're gluten intolerant or you're dairy intolerant or you're peanut intolerant or you're peach intolerant, doesn't matter. You're eating foods that bother you and your body says, those aren't good for me and you eat them anyway, or you take some Nexium to block the reaction and those cause swelling in the inner lining in the intestine. And now you really don't absorb stuff and you've got an inflammatory reaction going on inside the body. And no wonder you don't absorb amino acids very well. And if you're starting with low protein diets, like vegetarians and vegans, I can take an amino acid panel. You don't tell me anything about that person, their age, anything. And you show me their, their serum, I mean, it's fasting level of serum amino acids. And I will tell you 99 times out of 100, there's a vegetarian or a vegan because they're severely protein malnourished, okay? There's a few people that get away with it because they have a they have an intestinal flora that will manufacture amino acids for them, but it's very rare. And if you've been on it for more than six to 12 months, you're gonna, you're gonna be protein malnourished. So, so if you don't have the things that you need, then your body can't perform. Now your intestinal lining is supposed to turn over every four or five days. But guess what happens if you're protein malnourished? It doesn't turn over every four or five days. It might be a week. You might get an injury or you work out real hard. Well, if you have enough protein or usable amino acids, you heal pretty quick. If you don't, you heal slow or you get chronic injuries or you don't get improved performance when you work out because your body can't take the stress of the weights or the track or the bicycle and fix the things that you stressed, which would then be, be able to make you stronger, but it can't do it because it's got a laundry list of muscles, tendons, ligaments, you know, neurotransmitters, bone, gastric intestinal lining. And at the end of the day, it's like, like I can't complete my list because I don't have the stuff I need. And this is, this is like almost everybody walking around. Mm -hmm. So if you eat enough protein, if you do, if you go with layman, a gram per, per pound of body weight, that is a boatload of protein. Okay. I've tried it. It's really hard. I have to eat 170 grams of protein every day. I can't do it. Okay. It's just too much. Okay. Um, you know, four eggs is only 30 grams of protein. How am I going to get to 170? Mm -hmm. You know, I, I can't eat more than four eggs at one time. And you have to eat the yolks because the, because the protein is no good without the yolks. So like the whites are very inefficient. So my solution has been, and this is what I do with people, this perfect amino formula, our amino acids, and they're, they're, they're like three times the, the, um, efficiency of good meat protein. And so if you take two scoops of perfect amino, uh, essential amino acids, that is equal to 30 grams of steak. The nice thing about it is there's no virtually no calories in it. Your body doesn't have to digest it. It is absorbed through the stomach lining and in your blood within 23 minutes. And so if I get up and I take two scoops of, of perfect amino first thing in the morning, I got 60, I got 30 grams of protein in the tank right away. Okay. And then some people are eating breakfast. Some people aren't. If you're trying to eat 170 grams of protein in two meals, good luck. Yeah. Okay. Good luck. You can't do it. Um, probably more than 40 or 50 grams of protein at a given meal. You're not going to be able to even digest it or, or use it. It's just, it's just too much. Mm -hmm. So if I take two scoops in the morning, and then I have four eggs. So now I got 30 of perfect amino and I got 30 grams of eggs. And then at lunch, I have seven, you know, I have a, a six to eight ounce portion of some kind of meat fish. And at dinner, I have another portion of the same thing. And I take another two scoops of perfect amino. I, I hit my 170, hmm. 160. Okay. And then, and I tell you, it, it really works. You know? So with that, your muscle protein synthesis, do we need 
I listen to Layman and Gabrielle Lyons podcast together all the time and you need the dose spread out. What are your suggestions? The 30, 50 grams to get the benefit and it has to have the leucine threshold. You get, when you do it that much, you get the leucine threshold. So that's not a problem. And, and right, you can't do a mono meal and do this. So you can't just have like 10 grams of protein and then two hours later have another 10 grams. You need that right dose to create the response for muscles. We found that with perfect amino, if you take one or two tablets, you're sort of wasting your time. Yeah. But if you get 10 grams, you get that bolus and that hits the system. And it's like, oh, here's a signal. We got amino acids now. Now we're going to make protein. The 10 and grams, hold on though. Sorry to interrupt. The 10 grams is how many two tablets? Scoops, but if you scoops, take the pills of 10, yeah. oh, 10 tablets, okay. And what's interesting is I find if anybody who's doing endurance athletics, you take these amino, you know, there's this, there's this thing of when the brain thinks that that the body could be injured by what you're doing, you're going too hard too long. Mm -hmm. It shuts off here, and then you don't have the power, or the muscles feel sore, or you're, you you feel like you reach your your VO2 threshold. Um, but really, the brain hits it before the as a protective thing hits it before. And we have electrolytes with perfect amino in and. And I, I usually add a scoop of perfect amino in my water bottle with the electrolytes, because if you're feeding that central nervous system, these amino acids, it's getting the signal of, oh boy, we're good. Mm -hmm. We got the recovery stuff in us now. We got it. We're, we're okay. And I can tell a difference because I don't feel sort of bonky. You know, I can feel bright even with, with long, hard workouts because it, the, the body actually responds to it very well. So just to jump onto that comment, do you, when you're training on the bike and you're putting that in your water bottle the aminos are you doing any other fuel source along the way are you just if it's long i do i usually i i usually add ribose so and i'll add a mixture with um um uh, we have a greens and a reds product and there's some carbs in there and there's a lot of phyto phytonutrients in there mm -hmm. so you know, so I'll, I'll add those in. And then I, I mean, if I, if I'm, if I'm doing a, a half Ironman or an Ironman, I will, I will, I will take bars. I will take food with me. I will, I, I get hungry. Uh, I'm not trying to do it all liquid. Yeah. Uh, and, and it's interesting. I wear a transcutaneous glucose monitor. Mm. And um, so everyone in my family is obese and everyone's diabetic. Okay. And I could be, if I wasn't really careful. They're a type two or one? Two. Two. they're all two okay <laughs> so i wear that i've been wearing the monitor for a couple of years and it's very interesting like a healthy glue if you took a body and you drained all the blood and you measured how much glucose was in all of your blood volume your six liters five or six liters of blood it would be equal to about a teaspoon, teaspoon of yeah. sugar, about five grams. Mm -hmm. Now, diabetics only have 10 grams. The, the difference between healthy me metabolic glucose is only five more grams of sugar circulating in the guy's blood. And now he's a full-fledged diabetic. Mm -hmm. I think that athletes, if they measured this, and I just did this this last weekend because I was playing around with it. So I went for a two hour run. I usually run with just perfect amino. Um, and I usually run pretty much fasted. And I'm very fat adapted and I do fine. And I thought, I'm just going to see what happens. And my blood sugar is between 85 and 90. I feel fine. I take a goo. Okay at like four miles. Within 20 minutes, my blood sugar goes from 85 to 169. Wow. Talk about stressing a chemical system. Yeah. Like you think you're helping your body. Your body just got IV, it wasn't IV, it was oral. A sugar dose, which throws the whole thing sort of upside down. Like, oh my God, what are we going to do with all this sugar? It isn't a benefit. It's the wrong thing. Mm -hmm. That doesn't mean you can't take calories, but I think 
one of these performance things that I think people should test on, you know, that you, you get help and test with yourself is what does give you a response that's very balanced, that keeps your glucose level good. Because some people will run long and their glucoses will go low and they can't make enough, you know, mobilize enough glycogen or, or you know, or break down enough amino acids to be able to keep their blood sugar up and, and they, need, they need fuel. But what is that right fuel? And what is the dosage so that you can keep your hydration and keep your metabolic system good? And I don't think hardly anybody's paying attention to this in the industry. You know, very few people are. Yeah. Well, say this to people, they never, they're like, oh my God, I wonder what it does to me. Mm -hmm. Well, I bought Panoe metabolic testing cart this past spring so I can do metabolic testing on athletes or of all levels, but testing people's so you're testing their fat to carb burn during the exercise and at rest, but I want to test their glucose as well and, and start experimenting like that. And it's like, all right, let's do our own protocol and do three minutes at each stage and then add in your fuel that you normally do and see what happens. But having a CGM would be so much better than testing their glucose with a well, it saves finger. Up the finger pricks. And I, I don't like the finger pricks. Yeah. No, but I think it's so, cause I'm really into personalization. Like let's not do everyone saying this, let's figure out what I need to do as an individual and what works best for me and figure out your feeling and training plan and race plan and figure out what works best. But it is good to, you know, be able to see, is this working or not? Or even just, you know, look at your times, look at your heart rate, look at your heart rate variability score the next day. If you don't have access to a, a CGM, continuous glucose monitor or, pricking your finger because people don't want to spend the money on that because it does cost a lot to do a levels and NutriSense. So it's, you know, if you yeah, can get your doctor to I, give it to you. Yeah. But, um, yeah. Okay. <laughs> my doctor prescribe it. And, and, and if you look for deals, you, we, we can get them here at CVS for about 40 bucks a month, 42 bucks a month. Can anyone buy it then? Huh? Can anyone well, just go buy one? But you just have to get your, get your, talk your doctor into it because he doesn't yeah. have any idea of this stuff. And it's not, I mean, it's just a, it's just, it should be over the counter. It's crazy that it's even a prescription thing. Mm -hmm. It's, um, but I think most doctors, if you said, look, I'm, I got a history of diabetes in my family and I want to do this thing and I'm willing to pay for it out of pocket. And it's going to be, I don't know, 40 or 50 bucks a month. And you may not need it forever, but you learn about yourself a ton uh, and, um, like with my system right now, it, I'm very sensitive. A couple of blueberries will take me to 160. Mm -hmm. Okay. So I, you know, I'm, 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 I, I go very low carb because with my genetics at my age, it just doesn't, I, I just have to watch it. If I want to keep my, you know, my fasting insulin low and my hemoglobin A1C low, because it'll, it, the, these things are, are very longevity tied. And they're also very performance tied that you, you, you manage these things and there's tools to do it. You know, there's watches now. I bought one of these things, forgot the name of it. I don't know if it was on Instagram for like 130 bucks. And it gives you a glucose level off of your wrist through the blood. Oh, well, they have it out now. Is it accurate? But they're out. They're not great, but they're not terrible. So you have to do, you have to equilibrate the watch. So you poke your finger. And then it says you're 85. And then you set the watch that this level is 85. And I found that it's within 10 or 15 points, which for a cheapo watch and no poking is pretty good. Now I'm not, I don't work for them. I don't endorse them. And, you know, it's just within, I think a pretty not long time, the, the Apple and everybody else is going to have this technology available and then everybody can take advantage of it and won't cost anything. Yeah. I think it's huge to test and not guess and be able to monitor that information so people can get their doctor. You know, I just tried to get my insulin measured when I did my annual checkup. So I had to say, yes, you know, type two diabetes runs in my family and just tell them or put it on your <laughs> history sheet because they don't know. 
if it's true or not. So you just have to add it in there. Same with thyroid. If you want a full thyroid panel, you have to work the system as well. Yes, my hair is falling out. My hands and toes are very cold. <laughs> it's just kind of add to it. Do, do what you can. Yeah. But Absolutely. I was going to say, though, I think it's important to figure out the personalization of it because there's this current trend of everyone that's doing the sprint interval training and men versus women training and going from this, just, I just laugh and watch everyone and listen to all these other fellow podcast friends and influencers and coaches that now we're into, okay, eat no carbs, have zero carbs. And then it's, you know, keto and now it's carnivore, no carbs. Now it's all right, have carnivore and have all the fruit you want. And I'm totally insulin resistant, prone to that. I'm carb, my genetics all show, I've done all the different reports. I'm carb intolerant. I'm prone to type two diabetes. And I, my friend, I was like, oh, are you adding in your fruit salad in the morning? You know, fruit's the big thing. And like, I can't have that much of fruit and add that in. So I just think we can't just say everyone needs to do it this way and really look at personalizing And a CGM is a good example and doing the meta, a metabolism test, a rest and during exercise, if you can, because everyone's now saying do carnivore and add fruit and honey, <laughs> but how much is too much for you is going to be individual. Yeah, absolutely right. You're, you're completely right. And, you um, know, the idea of carnivore and, and, you know, Paul, this Paul Saladino, you know, I, 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 I'd, I'd be a fat slob and a, and diabetic in three months on that. It, it I, I'm, I'm like you, my genetics suck in that area. And um, I got to really watch the carbs. And if I watch the carbs and make it sort of, you know, mostly protein with balanced fat and, and, uh, and, and low carb, I don't eat, it's not like no carb, but it's, mm -hmm. it's low carb, yeah. but I can keep control on it. And then, and then metabolically for my system, for my genetics, for my age, that works out. And I think that's, you're, that's exactly the way it ought to be. Mm -hmm. And you can try and experiment with these things, but uh, if it's not working for you, that's not the right thing for you. We are really exactly. individual. If it's not working, don't keep trying to do it. You know, it's a sign. Do something different. Yeah. yeah. So I know we're going to run out of time here, but going back to the protein goal, because I know as I keep talking about the one gram of protein per ideal pound of ideal body weight, but at least get hundred grams a day. And again, we went from doing intermittent fasting and fasted exercise and one meal a day. And now it's like, all right, now I got to do three meals a day, but it is I end up eating one main meal, like I just ate at two o'clock and I'm not going to eat another meal before, because I go to bed at eight o'clock and get up early, but I, <laughs> I go to bed early. But the point is, I think it's so challenging, as you said, to get those protein goals. So that's why I take the amino supplements because it's impossible for me to eat that much because I just had tri-tip, a big plate of it, and I'm full. <laughs> and I'm not going to have another meal before I go to bed because I'm still going to be full and I have to take digest enzymes because I don't break it down. So mm -hmm. I need to take my enzymes or digestive support or else it'll sit there for five hours. And I know I'm protein deficient, even though I'm eating protein. So note people, signs and symptoms of malnourishment might be what you're eating, but how you eat it, break it down and absorb it. But I think we do need to supplement because it's really hard to get enough. So what guidelines would you suggest for people to, you know, we'll put the links in the show notes, but protein, taking the supplements throughout the day, morning, nighttime, before, during, after training, endurance training versus strength training, any suggestions to finish our conversation today? Well, I think taking, taking your uh, 10 grams of perfect amino first thing in the morning before you work out is really good. Um, and then doing the calculation. So for me, I need two scoops twice a day. And that gives me 60 grams, the equivalent of 60 grams of what dietary protein would be. And then with three meals, I can eat another 100 grams of protein, mm -hmm. you know, 30 grams of breakfast, 30 grams at lunch, 30 grams at dinner or so, you know, six ounces of six to seven ounces of steak is probably, is probably 40 grams of protein. Same with fish. So, um, so you can do it. And the, the emphasis is, is on protein. I think the layman research is really good. You need two things. You need muscles and you need a brain. And, and, and if you got those two things, um, you can get those two things by eating protein and then adjusting your calories. Some people tolerate carbohydrates. Well, carbohydrates are, are a fuel and they're real. And I think if they're coming in in a non-refined form, 
they're um, they're they're good. Um, de, you know, depending on 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 what your own metabolic health is, mm -hmm. and so perfect amino is, you know, if you're doing protein powders, that that is not perfect amino. Like collagen, you need eight essential amino acids in order to make protein, and the the what people will say or what the science has said is that you need nine or 10 amino acids. We have proven that if you take perfect amino on an empty stomach, measure your serum amino acid levels, take perfect amino 10 grams on an empty stomach, and then check blood levels of the two amino acids, which are, are called conditionally essential, like, like, like people probably need them. And one's arginine and the other one's histidine that if you give it to people and then we measured at 30 minutes, 60 minutes and 90 minutes, did the histidine and arginine levels go up when you took perfect amino that didn't have those two amino acids in it? And they did. So it is false that you need nine amino acids. It is false. And so if you take perfect amino, it is 99% utilized to make body protein. And what you want is enough of it coming in so that you never have a deficit. Your body never has a backlog of things that it either wants to make or fix. And then the body can sort of stay with it. And so, you know, people with osteoporosis have long-term protein deficiency because collagen is half of bone, the rest is mineral. And you can give calcium till the cows come home. If you don't build that bone where the calcium sits, you're not gonna fix bones. You know, if you're depressed, if you have low hormone levels, if you're anxious, these are all based on amino acids. And I, I just set, I just set a new record for myself of maximum heart rate. I was in a triathlon three weeks ago and um, there's five other guys there and we're all very competitive with each other. And I came off the, I came out of the swim. I knew I was first because I'm in the same rack as them and their bikes were still there. And I rode as hard as I could. And I, and I, when I got off the bike, no one had passed me. <laughs> and then I started running as hard as I could. And I looked down at my watch and my heart's, I'm, I'm at like 192. Like you're not supposed to be able to do that. The, the, the most I'd seen prior was 186 and um, and I was actually fine. I, I was like, oh my God, how am I doing? Do I have chest pain? I was working hard, but am I, you know, am I in trouble? I was like, no, I'm okay. I'm gonna slow down a little bit. But um, these things rebuild your body. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I can't run as fast as I used to. Aging does occur, but if you, you know, if you take the right stuff in and amino acids are like everybody I see, I put them on at least 10 grams a day and many people need 20 grams a day and they see the difference. Their hair is better. Their nails are better. Their energy is better there. Mm -hmm. Oh, their hemoglobin's better. Their chronic anemia and people are giving them iron and the hemoglobin is not going up. And hemoglobin is made is a protein. Mm -hmm. It's made out of amino acids. Yeah. And so all these various factors are really important. And we, I mean, we have thousands and thousands of success stories from people who take perfect amino, you know, who say my chronic plantar fasciitis healed finally, or my lower back disc herniation finally healed. The body's a miracle machine and can do a lot of stuff if it's got the raw materials that it needs in order to do it. Mm -hmm. And those raw materials, you know, there's two there's two essential nutrients, amino acids and essential fats. And there's vitamins and minerals, but there's no essential carb. And so you got to put those two things in. And then I think you'd be surprised at, at, at what you can do or, or how well it helps your own system. And I think part of that last 10 years, people have been going to low carb, high fat and forgetting about protein and now protein's yeah. back in the spotlight. But then I yeah. find most people, as we discussed, don't eat enough protein and they don't digest protein because I know every lab test I've done, people have elevated H pylori and low scoring on digest enzymes, almost like 99.9% .9 of the time. So 
again, it is, you know, are you eating enough protein, but are you breaking down your protein? So I think the great solution is to find out with a, a blood chemistry and a lab test analysis and correlate all the clues together, but that we do need to supplement and take these building blocks to put our body back together. Cause we are asking a lot of it and we break it down. And if we're trying to stay youthful as I am, <laughs> as I'm in my second half of my life to live my best life, the second half of my life, I have to take a little bit more ownership of my health and supplement where I need to with what I prioritize muscle health now, and that I need to take amino acids and, and people all, you know, are saying, here's my supplement protocol. Here's what I'm taking. And I always want to go, okay, let's, let's start with the basics. What do you need to do? What's essential part of life and aging and recovery and repair and everything we're made of, as you said, it's the building blocks. Right. Right. So good, good job. on you. <laughs> all right. Thanks. Well, I know it's evening time for you. You're three hours ahead. So we'll let you go and then we'll add anything else in the show notes that we forgot and where can people find more about you and your products and your book so uh, two websites our clinic is called life works wellness center it's all one word uh and the uh the product business is called body health so it's bodyhealth.com on both websites there's hundreds of videos lots of information you can learn about the products or you can learn about our clinic services um we do see new patients so if you're if you're interested in seeing us you can fill out an online form and one of our staff will call you uh we're in clearwater florida um if you like warm oceans um it's really nice <laughs> uh it's called clearwater because the water's nice uh and my book is available at amazon it's called the search for the perfect protein it's also available um, in audiobook form, which I'd suggest because it's it's uh, there's a live discussion at the end of each chapter uh, between me and another guy to sort of flesh out what's in the book. Um, and it's not a book written for necessarily health professionals. It's it's really readable, yeah. and I think you'll learn a ton about all the ways protein uh, factors into health. And how by increasing your protein through taking amino acids, we call it the perfect protein, because these eight essential amino acids really are the perfect protein, mm -hmm. uh, that you can help yourself and um, and live longer and do better. Yeah, do better. Yeah. Live longer, quality life. I always want to add in and see people say live longer, but we want to live a higher quality, good, healthy lifestyle <laughs> as we get older, yes. for sure. And are you doing, what Ironmans are you doing next year, 2024, anything on the I'm list? I'm still looking, I have a really busy travel schedule and I'm, I'm, I'm looking, I'm not settled yet. Uh, so I can't tell you yet. <laughs> well, I know I'm in Kona this Christmas for a couple of weeks and then I will be there for Ironman Hawaii, the men's race next year. So hopefully you'll be there racing or watching. <laughs> uh, it might be, it might be. <laughs> Can't miss out. It's always uh, fun. And it was, uh, it was. Uh, uh, I hadn't been to Kona in a in a bunch of years, so it's, it's one of my favorite places on earth. Yeah, me too. It's my magic healing place and a good place to be and just feel like you can unplug and recharge. <laughs> sure. Okay. Sure. All right. Thanks so much for your time today. Appreciate it. Okie doke. Aloha. <laughs>